Hello there. Brexit has severely disrupted the cooperation between the North Sea countries in the expansion of offshore wind power. But now the EU and Great Britain are cooperating again. Surprise, surprise. For years, Great Britain, a number of EU countries and the European Commission have coordinated the expansion of offshore wind power in the North Sea Energy Cooperation, the NSEC. With Brexit, the British left the cooperation with Belgium, Denmark, France, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway and Sweden. But now they are at it again. On Sunday, NSEC members, together with the UK, agreed on a new attempt at cooperation. A declaration of intent was to be signed that evening, which would make it possible to restart operational cooperation with Great Britain, also for my home country, Germany. In particular, joint offshore wind farms, power lines for cross-border electricity exchange, so-called interconnectors, and the production of hydrogen on the high seas are planned, according to the German Federal Ministry of Economics. He is very pleased to have the British on board the North Sea cooperation again, said German Federal Minister of Economics Robert Habeck from the Greens to the German newspaper Handelsblatt shortly before the planned signing of the Declaration of Intent. This will make it possible in the future to develop concrete joint offshore projects with this important partner country, which will benefit our supply of green electricity, added the minister. So he would do everything with everyone to get that. The expansion of offshore wind power plays a key role in the EU's plan to set up a climate neutral power supply system. By 2030, at least 60 gigawatts of offshore wind power should be installed in all sea basins in the EU. And by 2050, it should be 340 gigawatts. Germany wants to make a significant contribution to this. Offshore wind capacities of 7.8 gigawatts are currently installed in the German part of the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. By 2030, it should be 30 gigawatts and 70 gigawatts by 2045. Just for clarification, 30 gigawatts correspond to the installed capacity of around 30 nuclear power plants. However, the electricity yield of wind power is significantly lower. While a nuclear power plant ideally produces electricity almost all 8,760 hours of the year, similar to fossil fuel power plants, an offshore wind turbine at favorable locations in the North Sea achieves around 4,500 full load hours per year. On land, it's often only 2,500. Offshore wind power can play to its strength, particularly when the farms are networked across national borders. The electricity can be better distributed if it finds buyers in several markets at the same time. And the meshing of the wind farms also reduces the costs of connecting to the grid. Great Britain can play an important role in this. The conditions for offshore wind power off the British coast are very good, and uh, or mostly the Scottish coast, and the financial support for wind power expansion is repeatedly praised by the industry as exemplary. German companies have been using this for a long time. The RWE Group alone operates wind turbines off the coast of the United Kingdom with an installed capacity of 3.86 gigawatts. The work of the North Sea Energy Cooperation is supplemented by the Pentalateral Energy Forum, whose members are Germany, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, Austria and Switzerland. The members agreed on Sunday to intensify their cooperation. The aim of the forum is to interlink the energy markets of the countries more closely in order to increase security of supply and increase efficiency. Minister Habeck said that, especially in times of the energy crisis, it was of inestimable importance that we coordinate closely with our neighbors in the Pentalateral Forum on Security of Supply and Crisis Management. And if another phase from the Brexit time of the Brexit negotiations is back. In a planned change at the top of government in Ireland, former Deputy Prime Minister Leo Varadkar has taken over as Prime Minister or Taoiseach. Irish President Michael D. Higgins appointed him as the new Taoiseach after a special session of Parliament on Saturday afternoon. That's what the Irish broadcaster RTE reported. Varadkar from the Conservative Party Fine Gael replaces Mion Martin from the also Conservative Party Fianne Fáil. Don't get me wrong if I uh, hit me because of the names, but uh, Martin will be the vice now. 
The coalition was also includes the Irish Greens had already agreed on the change at the beginning of their cooperation in 2020. With a planned replacement of the Taoiseach, some ministers are also changing their posts. The next elections in Ireland are scheduled for 2025 at the latest. The formation of the Conservative Green Coalition government in Ireland two years ago was considered historic. Before that, Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil had alternated in government. Varadkar previously headed a Fine Gael government from 2017 to 2020, sanctioned by Martin's Fianna Fáil. The largest opposition party is currently the left-wing Sinn Féin, which is the only party in the British region of Northern Ireland, by the way. For a long time, Sinn Féin was considered the political arm of the underground organization IRA, which fought at gunpoint during the civil war in Northern Ireland for unification of the two parts of Ireland. In the meantime, the party has renounced violence and also carried out a generational change. The Brexit debate has dominated daily events not only in the United Kingdom since 2013. In the European Union too, Great Britain's exit from the EU repeatedly caused debates and disputes. And on February 1st in 2020, Great Britain left the EU. And on January 1st, 2021, the country left the customs union and the internal market of the EU. The transition period that came served to ensure that the contracts for economic cooperation did not break off from one day to the next. And British representatives and EU diplomats struggled to reach a joint exit agreement until the last moment. And the negotiations were tough. The negotiations only ended on Christmas Eve. On December 30th in 2020, the British House of Commons overwhelmingly approved the Brexit trade deal. MPs voted 521 to 73 in second reading for the EU law proposed by Prime Minister Johnson. Important changes affect trade in goods, logistics, aviation and the financial sector. Experts anticipate long-term negative consequences for the UK economy. Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the time, on the other hand, tried to sell the deal as a success. I just say, often ready deal. And Brexit also has an impact on the unity of Great Britain. The Scottish government wants to discuss its further strategy in its quest for independence from the United Kingdom next March. At a special conference on March 19th in Edinburgh, the Scottish National Party, the SNP, wants to discuss and decide how the path towards independence should look like. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon tweeted this on Saturday, and I talked about this in another video already. The pro-independence advocates have recently had to put up with a setback. In November, the British Supreme Court ruled that Scotland cannot hold a referendum without the approval of London which initially put plans for an independence referendum in the coming year on hold. Sturgeon had previously announced that if that were the case, she would consider the next UK general election a de facto referendum instead. And according to a survey after the court ruling, support among Scots for secession from the United Kingdom increased. In a survey conducted by the polling institute Redfield and Wilton at the end of November, almost half of the Scots surveyed with 49% said they supported their country's independence and want that, no, they said if a referendum were imminent and 45% would therefore vote no and the rest was undecided. In a comparable survey from September last year, only 44% said they wanted to vote yes. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon wants to take her country out of the UK and back into the European Union. And her reasoning is clear. Brexit has changed the situation in such a way that a new referendum has to take place. In 2014, a majority of Scots voted against independence to stay in the EU. That was the main reason for the vote to stay. And... Um, that definitely has changed, even if the British government always talks about a once-in-a-lifetime decision. Once-in-a-lifetime would something considerable under the same circumstances. But between 2014 and today, the circumstances have changed that much that they even... They, there might be a lot of delusional people and it might be, after what we heard now, a lot of people on cocaine or something similar. 
but even they can't believe themselves what they are saying. It is not the same situation, but they absolutely fear to reap what they've sown themselves. And that's the problem with the whole thing. And I'll see you in my next video. I'll be back.